Welcome to Peg Talk. I'm your host, Peg Luxick. This is going to be a very different Peg Talk. There will be no special effects and there will be no graphics. We are going to be discussing a topic that is critically important to all of us. We are going to be looking at the difference between Islam and the Judeo-Christian religious connection. In the days following 9-11, the question that Americans asked the most was, why do they hate us? It wasn't just the people who drove their airplanes into the World Trade Center. It was the fact that there were celebrations in Middle Eastern countries, that in the years since then, we've seen pictures of folks wearing t-shirts with the image of the World Trade Towers in flames, that time and again, we've seen acts of terror perpetrated by folks claiming to act in the name of Islam. And it doesn't make any sense. Now, I've read the Quran before, but the first time I read it, I looked for specific quotes. How did they talk about women? Did they really speak about a jihad? What did they say? Just as probably many of you have. But in attempting to answer the question of why is there so much hatred, I read the Quran differently. I wasn't looking for specific quotes. I was looking to see if I could understand the world view of those who subscribe to the religion of Islam. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, let me tell you, I am a practicing Catholic. But for this discussion, I am going to attempt to step outside of the religious framework that I grew up in. So it's not us and them, it's them and them. As if I were someone from another planet looking at these two worldviews and attempting to make sense of them separately and then together. So I'm going to do everything I can to be as respectful as possible to the uh, folks who believe in all of the different religions. For the purposes of this discussion, we're going to talk about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, because those are the ones most prevalent in the Western civilization uh, struggle with the Middle East. And we're going to be attempting to answer the question, why is there so much hatred? Now, to begin that conversation, we need to begin with the deity of each of the religions. Judaism and Christianity have the same deity in terms of the original person. And for the purposes of this discussion, we're not going to use the word God because it's confusing. We're going to use the word Jehovah for the deity of Judeo-Christianity, and Allah for the deity of the Muslims. And there's a reason for that. When we use the word God, we all assume that we mean the same thing, and we don't. The deity of Judeo-Christian religions is an entirely different entity than the divine person in Islam. The deity in Judaism and Christianity is rooted in love. And if you looked at the book, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, you would again and again and again see that deity referred to as Father. In the Old Testament, that deity in the Psalms, for example, talks about loving the children, the humans, as his children. Allah is not father. In fact, I had a friend who was a, a Protestant uh, pastor and he was on a plane trip and he happened to be sitting beside a cleric, an Islamic cleric. And, and in the discussion, he kept talking about Father God. And finally, the Islamic cleric said, please stop doing that. That's an insult. We do not believe that Allah is father. And in fact, in the Quran, over and over and over again, Muhammad clearly states that humans are not the children of Allah and that it is an affront to think that you would be. So the, the deity is an extremely different person 
And from the point of view of Muslims, it's insulting to them when we refer to Allah as God. Just as if Harry and Tom are walking down the street and you consistently called Harry Tom, Harry would be insulted because they're two very different individuals. Well, the divine personage in the Judeo-Christian tradition is a very different person than the divine personage in the Islamic tradition. When I read the Quran this time, I was about a third of the way through it, and I realized I had not yet seen the word love as applied to God, which got me to thinking. And so I looked up, you know, you how you Google search. When you Google search the word love and God in the Jewish Bible and in the Christian Bible, it's almost too many times to count. But in the Quran, it's never there. Allah does not love his followers. Jehovah does. Conversely, in the relationship between the follower and the divine person, we are called to love God. In the Quran, the followers are called to dread God. And that is the actual word over and over and over again. If you look at the physical posture in Judaism and Christianity, a person in prayer would have head up and arms up, reaching up to the deity, like a child reaches up to a parent. Think about the posture of Muslims in prayer. They're on their knees and their heads are on the ground. Reaching up to Allah would be an affront. Bowing before Allah in dread is the desired mindset. Moving past the deity, the central person in Judaism and Christianity would be described as redeemer. Now in Judaism, the redeemer is referred to in the future tense and in Christianity, the redeemer is referred to in the past tense, but the central person is redeemer, someone who came, comes or came to save the believers. In Islam, Muhammad describes himself, the central person, as someone who came to warn the believers. There is no redeemer. There is no savior. Muhammad is self-describes as the warner, someone who came to warn about proper submission and dread toward Allah. In Judaism and in Christianity, the highest commandment is to love God. In fact, in Christianity, we are instruct Christians are instructed to love God with their whole heart and mind and soul. There is no such command in Islam. The instruction is to dread God, to fear Allah. So the worldview, the relationship between the divine person and the adherents is significantly different between the two religions. When you apply that then, and you take that understanding, and you move into Islam, what the Quran says over and over and over again is that the adherents have been warned that it is an abomination to believe that Allah would stoop to love his adherents. It is an abomination. It is an affront. It is blasphemy for the adherents to think that they would have the ability to love Allah. 
And the purpose of Muhammad was to warn the followers that that is an abomination. That means by definition that Judaism and Christianity in the very way that the adherents interact with their divine personage are in the minds of a Muslim blaspheming. What they are doing is an abomination. Now, as the Quran talks about that, Muhammad talks about the people of the book, the people who have come from Judaism and Christianity. And his point is, well, you got it wrong. And I'm now here to tell you, this is how you do it correctly. And if you do not bow in dread after you have been warned, then you deserve whatever punishment comes your way. Now, that doesn't mean that every Muslim thinks that they are the punishing agents, but it does mean that if an individual does not accept the warning of Mohammed, any negative thing that happens is deserved, is warranted, is Allah exercising justice upon the non-belief, non-respect um, of those who refuse to accept the might and the majesty and the power and the, the absolute authority of Allah. From the point of view of the adherents of Islam, any punishment they receive from Allah is warranted and they should be happy that they're not being punished more because it's, they're not the children of Allah. They're the property of Allah. And they are called to cower in dread before the might and majesty of this divine personage who does not love them at all. And if one dares to believe that the, a divine personage could love them or that they would dare to lift their eyes in a loving relationship, that is an abomination and deserves to be punished. They don't hate us because of Western culture or Western movies or Western dress. At the very core of the two religions is an irreconcilable difference because it is the very nature of the relationship between the deity of that faith and the adherent of that faith. And for a Muslim, those who do not bow before the might and majesty of Allah deserve the punishment. So they don't feel bad when a punishment happens. They don't step forward in outrage when there is an atrocity because the underpinnings of their faith say those who do not believe, those who do not bow, deserve to be punished in any way that Allah chooses to mete out that punishment. It's a very different mindset than, for example, Christianity, which talks about turning the other cheek and love your enemies. It's, it's a completely different way of looking at life. And so when we talk about how do we peacefully coexist, how do we work with each other, it is important, it is critical 
that we keep foremost in our minds the fact that the very fiber of our faith, if you are Jewish or Christian, is an abomination to those who subscribe to the faith that follows Allah. They don't hate us because of how we live. They hate us because of how we believe. What do we do with that? I'm not sure. I don't know how one peacefully coexists with an entity that begins by saying how others worship is an abomination to them. But it certainly explains why Christian missionaries are not allowed, are persecuted, are driven out, are uh, imprisoned in Muslim countries. Because underneath, the very fact of Christianity challenges the fundamental fact of Islam. There are those who say that's stereotyping. There are those who say that's hate mongering. In fact, it is neither. It is looking realistically at the two worldviews. And until we are willing to look honestly and realistically at the worldview that is the underpinning of Islam, we can't decide how to deal with it. We can't decide how to interact with it. And we are only fooling ourselves if we pretend that that is not the truth. I would urge you to read the Quran for yourself. Now you're going to have to look at a couple different translations because every English translation of the Quran is different from every other English translation translation of the Quran. I actually read three at one time, a book and then two computer programs. But I would urge you to read it for yourself. Don't look for specific quotes. Don't look to see, count how many times the word jihad is used. Look at the underlying philosophy. Because by understanding that philosophy, we can begin to have a realistic conversation about how these two worldviews can exist together in the same world. I'm Peg Luxick, and this is Peg Talk. And I thank you for taking the time to listen.